Uh, we have another key individual who will be operating the plant, uh, the general manager, Mr. Kevin Owens. So these will be, uh, and you can look for me too, or look for someone in a green shirt. Uh, but we are here to uh, make our presentation, and uh, we hope that it will bring better understanding as to what our project will be today and tomorrow and in the future. Okay, thanks, Warren. Uh, with that, I'll turn it back to Julie. Okay, so... Yeah, there's going to be at least an hour-long Q&A session. So anytime, anytime people want to... S oh, th there's a, this afternoon, there's public testimony. So you can present for an hour. It starts at 1 and it ends at 4.30. So that's three and a half hours of presentations for public testimony on anyone who supports or... Yeah. Well, yeah. So, so, the for, so the format of the meeting, so the form, this public information meeting format is we're going to start out with presentations to share information with the community about what these folks have done. So there's some education. And then there'll be time for questions. So people who want to ask questions, if you want to say something at that time that's not a question, you'll have two minutes. And then these folks will respond. And then this afternoon is with a hearings officer that is the official time to present testimony on the MPDES permit. So that's the format of the meeting. Why is only one side being presented? So, 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 you, so there's going to be an hour, which is, or at least an hour, if we can get going sooner, because I want to I move, all these presentations are supposed to be just a few minutes. So then we will move into the public portion where anybody who's here can come up and speak for up to two minutes. So I'd like to get to that quickly so that... It's not a half an hour of hu honua. So, so I'm going to refer back to the aloha etiquette. I'm going to ask you folks to let me run the meeting, okay? So it, be respectful, be concise, listen to understand, agree to disagree, and challenge ideas, not people. So I, I, what I like to do is I like to have a meeting that we can get to whatever you want to say as quickly as possible. That was my recommendation when I was asked to do this meeting, so that I'm trying to give you as much opportunity to speak as possible and get through this portion as quickly as possible. So I ask them to please keep it as short as possible. So I'm gonna move ahead. I would, li I would like to move ahead. We're here to do both things. They're here to present some information. I don't see, so let's, instead of assuming that um, anyone has any kind of intent, let's give people an opportunity to share information, and if you would like to get information or share your own information, there will also be an opportunity to do that, and I'd like to get to it. So I'm gonna move on. So the next part is going to be Glenn, who's with the Clean Water Branch. Thank you, Julie. Um, yeah, so one of the permits that the hearing uh, this afternoon will be about will be this on NPDES industrial stormwater permit. So I just wanted to give a little bit of information about the industrial stormwater permit. Uh, first of all, the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, that's NPDES, permits, they protect water quality by regulating discharges to uh, state surface waters, which, are, which is the ocean or streams. Uh, one of these permits is the industrial stormwater permit. And that regulates stormwater runoff that comes into contact with industrial processes at facilities. Uh, industrial processes can be uh, material handling and storage. It can be uh, manufacturing processes, equipment cleaning and maintenance, and other operations. Um. So we're going to hold we're going to hold all <laughs> questions till later. Please let it let us please get through this section. So then all of your questions can be addressed. If you would like, we have cards here that you can write your questions down on now as people are asking. Would that be helpful to pass those out now so you can save them? Could someone pass out the cards? And that way you can hold those or if something pops up in your ma mind while someone's talking, you can save it for later. Just to quickly answer that question though, uh, chemical spills are addressed. So, so only certain types of facilities need to get this NPDES permit. Uh, these could include uh, manufacturing facilities, salvage yards, recycling facilities, um, food production facilities, and steam, po steam electric power generating facilities. And the Huhonua permit is regulated under the steam electric power generating facility. Um, there are a lot of conditions in the permit that are required for Huhonua. 
a couple that I'll mention. Um, one of the main ones is that they need to um, maintain, inspect, and implement best management practices or BMPs. Uh, for those not familiar with BMPs, BMPs uh, help mitigate pollutants that are in the stormwater. Uh, they can be something physical, something structural, like a filter that filters out pollutants from the water, or they can be a practice or procedure, uh, like keeping a manufacturing area clean and free from debris. Uh, another requirement under the permit is that Huhonoa will also be required to sample um, stormwater before it leaves the facility during certain rain events. So there are requirements for them to take sampling, um, get it analyzed, and then send that information into the Department of Health. Um, so just that's just a very brief, basic uh, overview of the industrial stormwater permit. Thanks. Okay, next we're going to have Norris. He's going to be talking about the application for an underwater injection control, the UIC permit. Where is he? Underground injection control. Uh, by show of hand, anybody who's familiar with the UIC program or underground injection control program? Okay, not not many. I want to spend a little. Can you bit speak? Put the mic up closer to your mouth, please. Okay. I want to spend a little time explaining what my program is and what this UIC permit is uh, meant to regulate and protect. Back in about the 1980s. There were technical committees made on each island to help delineate where our drinking water aquifers are. So for each island, they created maps and they designated areas where injection wells for industrial wastewater like Huhonoa or sewage can't be constructed. And that they did it by what they call a UIC line. Areas, Mauka of the UIC line are where the drinking water aquifers are going to be protected. Areas of Makai of the line are the areas where injection wells can be constructed. Okay, so the UI the injection wells that we allow below the UIC line are issued a UIC permit. It's an operational permit which lists a bunch of conditions uh, and requirements and limitations as far as what the injection wells can receive and what they cannot. Huhonua had, in their application, met all the requirements as far as allowing us to approve the construction of the injection wells. Uh, there's one condition that uh, in my regulations, it, it will uh, uh, it will affect the way we regulate these injection wells. If if the discharge to the injection wells are found to be affecting the ocean, um, so we're going to be conditioning my UIC permit with conditions to go and look and see if the ocean is going to be impacted by the injection well discharges. Uh, right now, I, I believe today and tomorrow, our uh, vision on aquatic resources or the Department of Land and Natural Resources, they're up there right now doing a, a survey of the, the area that, the, in front of Huhonoa to, uh, to at least establish a baseline of what kind of aquatic uh, life is right is out there right now uh, I had more to talk about but I, I, if there's technical questions I'm gonna be setting up on that back table over there in that corner you know, uh, I think I'll do a much better job without this microphone <laughs> and speaking one-to-one -one. I notice there's a lot of people still um, Standing, if you have a seat that's open next to you, could you raise your hand again? Because anyone who really needs to sit down, who's, who's standing is not good for your body, please please come and take a seat. Um, we, we invite you to sit down so that you're comfortable. Can you, can you keep your hands raised again so people can see that there's seats next to you? Would you, would you folks like to come forward and, and take a seat? I hate to see people standing if they don't need to. It's kind of hard on the body if you have any back or knee or 
hip issues. So next we're going uh, to Joanna, who is going to be speaking on behalf of the Solid and Hazardous Waste brand. Thank you, Julie. Yes. So the Environmental Management Division is comprised of five different branches. And as you saw on the previous slide, um, what those branches were. This is, we, in our um, public notice, we mentioned that there was a solid waste permit for the recycling of ash. That application has not yet been received. So therefore, um, just to let you know, a permit is not required if solid waste is disposed, recycled, or otherwise managed at a DOH permitted facility um, per that statute. So that's up there. And then the solid hazardous waste branch will be reviewing the application or proposal upon receipt from the applicant. The next permit would be the covered source permit from the clean air branch was issued on February 18, uh, 2016. It expired on August 30th of 2016. However, the permit remains valid past that expiration date because they, um, the Huhunua submitted the complete renewal application at least one year prior to that expiration date. The next permit, um, there are additional permits in the clean water branch. These are general permit coverages for construction activities related to con construction of the biomass power plant as well as the electric switchyard station. Those expire December 5th, 2018. No, uh, but no, these are, so these can were can you issued hold your, in Can you hold your questions, please, until afterwards? Thanks. The individual wastewater system approval by the wastewater branch um, is in process. To date, no final approvals have been made or provided for these two septic systems. Um, so as you can see, they, the plan has been approved, but the operation of the systems have not. And at this time, I'm going to call Daryl Lum up to speak about the NPDES permits and subsurface discharges. Okay, good morning everyone. Um, I'm going to be discussing uh, NPDES permits and subsurface discharges. Okay, the reason we're going over this topic is because the Department of Health has received a lot of comments and inquiries from people asking whether the Huhanua facility's discharge into the UIC injection well is going to require an NPDES permit. And this is due to the proximity of the well to the ocean. Okay, so what I'm going to be doing with um, these coming slides is explaining the Department of Health's position on this. Okay, so in order to explain this topic and to, um, to uh, explain our position. I need to go, um, have you understand what exactly is an NPDES permit. Okay, so according to the Federal Clean Water Act, nobody can discharge pollutants through a point source into a state surface water unless they have an NPDES permit. Okay, so the term pollutant is defined in the Clean Water Act and it includes any industrial, municipal, or agricultural waste that could be released in the water, and this includes heat. The term um, point source is also defined in the Clean Water Act, and it includes any confined, discrete, discernible conveyance from which pollutants may be discharged. And state waters is defined in our state water quality standards, and it includes things like the ocean, streams, rivers, lakes, and wetlands. Okay, so a NPDES permit authorizes a facility to discharge a specific amount of pollutants to specific locations subject to all the conditions of the permit. Okay, the permit contains limitations on what can be discharged, it contains monitoring and reporting requirements, and it contains special conditions to help with compliance and to protect water quality. The Clean Water Branch of the State of Hawaii Department of Health has been authorized to administer the NPDES permit program in the state of Hawaii. And what this means is we've been, uh, we're issuing and we're processing the NPDES permits on behalf of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. So the Clean Water Branch has issued NPDES permits 
to different types of point sources that discharge directly to the state surface waters. Okay, so the question is, what about the subsurface discharges? Okay, and by subsurface, what I mean is when someone releases the pollutants into the ground, percolates, um, contacts the, the groundwater, and then it carries out with the groundwater into the ocean. Okay, um, regarding this topic, the EPA has indicated that when there is a discharge of pollutants from a point source to a state surface water that has a direct hydrologic connection to the surface water, this may require Clean Water Act permitting requirements, such as the NPDES permit. The EPA did not state that Clean Water Act permits are required for all pollutant discharges to groundwater in all cases. Okay, so NPDES permits do not regulate groundwater. Hawaii's water quality standards does not apply to groundwater. The only situation involving groundwater that may require an NPDES permit is when the discharge of pollutants to the surface waters can be proven to be by the groundwater. Okay, that is when there's a direct hydrologic connection between the groundwater and surface water that can be demonstrated. So EPA has indicated that this type of situation is fact specific. And some of the things that have to be um, looked into is the distance that it takes for the pollutants to travel through the surface water, um, the, and if the, um, the source of the, the point source is traceable. Okay, and all of these factors are very site specific and it, include, um, it involves things such as geology, flow, and slope. Okay, so in Hawaii, there was a court case, the Hawaii Wildlife Fund versus the County of Maui. And in this case, the, um, the court determined that the County of Maui needed to get an NPDES permit for their wastewater, um, the Lahaina Wastewater Reclamation Facility because the court determined that the county was discharging treated domestic wastewater into the injection well and there was a direct hydrologic connection from the well to the groundwater and to the ocean. Okay, the court also mentioned that they used three criteria to determine whether an NPDES permit was needed, and the criteria was that it was a point source, the discharge was more than the minimis, and the discharge was fairly traceable. Okay, so until the Department of Health can get more uh, clarification on this issue, we are going to follow the, the Hawaii court's decision and criteria for determining whether an NPDES permit is needed for subsurface discharges. And again, the, that criteria is point source, more than the minimis, and fairly traceable. Okay, so in the case of Huhanua, and based on, um, based on the information that we currently have, the Department of Health has determined that the discharge is not fairly traceable and therefore, we are not going to require an NPDES permit for the subsurface discharge at this time. Okay, there, Huhanua has prepared a thermal effects report, and in the report, there were assumptions made regarding um, where the discharge could enter the ocean, okay, but the actual location or locations of the discharge, or even if it will occur, is unknown. And when the Clean Water Branch issues NPDES permits, we have to specify in the permit the discharge locations. And in the case of Huhanua's subsurface discharge, we don't know where that is. Okay, so because... Go for it. Oh, God. Okay, so just because we're not going to require an NPDES permit, it does not mean that the DOH um, will not preclude us from conditioning the UIC operational permit, as Norris previously mentioned. And the DOH is also considering adding additional monitoring requirements in the, in the UIC operational permit, and that monitoring may be used to determine if the discharge is fairly traceable after the operation begins. Okay, but again, the Department of Health is not going to require an NPDES permit for the subsurface discharge at this time. Thank you. Uh, please hold your questions. Write them down. You got, you got the cards. Hold, hold your questions so that we can, we're almost to the question part. <laughs> Thank you. Just one more and then, and then it's all yours. 
Okay, let's see how we're doing on our time here. Okay, perfect. Okay, so last presentation before we get to the Q&A. Um, I believe it's Dennis. Good morning, Dennis Palma, consultant for Huhunua. I've been working, I worked at the old Hilo Coast Power Company many years ago, 18 years ago. Um, ago. Uh, so today I wanted to um, kind of break it down uh, a Dennis, bit. can you put the mic much closer to your mouth? Sure, there we go. <laughs> okay, so I wanted to break down what our process is here with the underground injection control wells, where the water comes from, and really to um, show how simple the process really is in that this is no different than any other steam electric power generating facility um, that purifies water, um, makes steam, and cools. So uh, you can go to the next slide. You can hit page down, it'll uh, do that. Okay, so just a quick overview. Um, this is a renewable um, power plant, a biomass energy. It's uh, defined by our Hawaii revised statutes. We've had significant planning for, you know, extensively for now 10 years. Um, the, you know, we are complying with all the rules. We are obtaining the, the permits that are necessary to operate the plant, um, including in construction, as well as local building permits and plumbing permits and electrical permits. Uh, we've, um, you know, we've, we, we have input, multiple input from multiple government agencies, including what we're experiencing here today as part of the informational meeting and our public hearing coming up. Um, and, you know, we've had local scrutiny as part of the special management area under the coastal zone management process uh, locally, uh, including a, a contested case back in 2010. Okay, so this, is, this has been a handout that I think uh, the, the, you've received in the community. It really just shows the cycle from the trees, when they're planted, how they get to the facility, um, how water's used, um, and that it's returned and cycled back uh, um, through the environment and that it is a renewable, sustainable process. Okay. So, um, so just a basic diagram. I'm not going to go through individually uh, the steps there. Um, I would like to get to the, the process. Uh, just this is, a, again, another flyer and, and handout that we've had to the community, just highlighting the different benefits of the product uh, project from economic benefits to jobs uh, to environmental benefits, uh, from being carbon neutral, reducing greenhouse gases, um, and moving the state closer to that 100% renewable energy goal. Okay, so again, today we have the two permits, the underground injection control well permit and the stormwater. The stormwater is a, a pretty basic, uh, where it's, we're actually, I don't, I don't uh, Glenn didn't mention it, but it's actually an individual permit. There are two types of permits. The individual permit um, it w uh, we have to obtain because the state uh, does not have its current authority to issue the general permits. Typically, these are general permits uh, for industrial activities uh, due to the types of uh, uh, administrative um, nature that they uh, issue the permits under. Okay, so this is really kind of the scroll down just a little bit, yeah. So this is to break down and to show really how simple that really the process really is. And the heart of what we're really talking about today is the underground injection control. And if you look at where the water is coming from, on the right-hand side, we don't have a laser today, but on the right-hand, upper right-hand side, you can see the brackish wells. And there'll be up to four wells that will supply um, what's considered brackish water. Um, to the boiler, the condenser um, uh, next, um, where the steam comes from the boiler, okay? And it's called non-contact cooling water because it does not come in contact with any uh, raw materials or other impurities as part of the process. It literally comes into this water box. It cools the steam that comes through tubing within the condenser. And then the water passes directly back out into, we're going to have three underground injection control wells. And that is actually 99.8% of the flow that's going to reach the wells. The other 0.2% is 
is from the water purification process. And in this case, we have other wells, the, the non-potable wells that are um, up the hill a little bit. And those will go into the water purification. And that is purifying the water to create steam. Steam has to be very pure water within the tubes. And it's really to prevent the scale and the corrosion um, that would be built up within those uh, water tubes. And in the purification process, we're taking a very low salinity, low chloride water, fresh water essentially. We're removing some of those impurities that we don't want to go through the pipes. And that then comes down and goes out through some micron filters um, and then passes into the UIC wells. And that is only 0.2% of the actual flow. Okay, so the last part of this then is the, the two green boxes are the chemical additives or the additives that are used to um, help protect the piping essentially uh, so that they maintain the quality that we need uh, so they don't decay and corrode on us. So the boiler water side, there's actually four um, additives or products that are used, again, for scale, corrosion, prevent deposition, um, and to keep the pipes clean. And they're all, they, none of them contain Clean Water Act listed chemicals um, above de minimis amounts. Uh, they're considered non-hazardous and, um, and they're used to, again, maintain the purity of the pipes inside the boiler. Additionally, there's one non-hazardous additive um, on the brackish wells and that is like a dispersant. So the minerals, there's natural mineral, minerals in the water that need to um, prevent that deposition within the pipes. And so the additive prevents that deposition from occurring. Okay, next slide. So we, we work closely with NALCO. They're a national worldwide uh, company. And uh, they really, you know, this technology has come a long way through the years and we've selected products with them to be non-harmful to the environment. Uh, they're considered non-hazardous. Um, so the EPA in non-contact cooling water technologies, the additives that are used are not considered hazardous. They're um, de minimis, essentially. Uh, and again, no additives contain those Clean Water Act substances or in quantities that are deemed to be hazardous. Um, they're less than 1% or considered de minimis by definition. So to put it in some other terms or to look at it of how much it is and visualize it, it's uh, the amount of additives that are used in the purification process is equivalent to one part per five million or that's 0.00002% of the 21.6 million gallons uh, being discharged. Um, I forgot to mention on the previous slide, um, I, we did not show the other, there's one other, other um, chemicals that are used within the laboratory. And again, that's for testing purposes, for maintaining the, the water purification system, the quality of the water in the boilers. And right now we are looking at other alternatives to those chemicals and the discharge from the laboratory sinks um, to, rather than going to the UICs, will go somewhere else. So we're considering different alternatives for that. Um, that, but the amount of chemicals in the laboratory that are actually used is less than three tablespoons per day. So think about how many put two tablespoons of sugar in their coffee every day, okay? That's the amount of actual chemicals that are being used in the laboratory to test the waters that are deemed uh, to, to check on that purity, okay? Next slide. Uh, another analogy or example is in our own public water supply. And in our public water supply, we pull water out of the ground. It gets treated with chlorine, a disinfectant, um, which goes into your water. It then goes into your home. You drink the water, you shower with the water, you bathe with the water, and then it goes out either through a wastewater treatment plant or through a cesspool um, into the ground and into the groundwater. So very similar. Uh, Public water is treated very similar to um, why we treat water to maintain purity and, and quality and such. Okay, okay so here um, I want to, I'm stepping back a little bit from what the state and the, the, our regulators uh, talked about. But again, non-contact cooling water within the, our regulatory framework, the EPA has this category for this. And they've determined there's actually no national effluent guidelines for non-contact cooling water. So, and again, because this water doesn't come in contact with 
raw materials or chemicals or impurities, um, there is no, there's nothing really to regulate because there's no contaminants in the water. Um, and so they also state, or the EPA believes, that the water quality standard limits that are established under the Clean Water Act by the state. Excuse me, ma'am. Excuse me, Kuhan. If this is a Huhonua presentation, Kuhan, then Malama Halakua should. We're going to have an hour and 15 minutes. Please, we are please. taxpayers. Yeah, I'm, I'm done, pretty much. This is my last slide. As soon as, as, soon as he gets through this slide, it's going to be the time for public Q&A, so please wait. The this is not a hearing. This is the public information meeting. The hearing will be at 1 o'clock. We're, we're just stating facts. So, so, please, so please just wrap it up, and we'll okay. get to the Q&A. So the, the just, last point I was making. Hold, hold on a second. Y'all have been so great. You've been so civil. You've been so aloha. Hang in there, and we're going to go to the Q&A as soon as the slide is done. Okay. And this relates back to what Daryl was just presenting under the NPDS and clean water. But the EPA for non-contact clean water believes that the, the limits that are established by our water quality standards by the state is sufficient to satisfy those best um, conventional control and best available technically economical achievable technology. So, and that is right out of EPA documents for these systems and for power plants. Okay, 